a clean escape. I've done this before. It's been quite a while, though. Okay. As she sat in her office waiting for exactly what she did not know, Dr. Evans hoped that it wasn't going to be another bad day. She needed a cigarette and a drink. She swiveled the chair around to face the closed Venetian blinds beside her desk, leaned back and laced her hands behind her head. She closed her eyes and breathed deeply. Air wafting down from the ventilator in the ceiling smelled of machine oil. It was cold. Her face felt it. The bulky sweater kept the rest of her warm. Her hair felt greasy. Several minutes passed in which she thought of nothing. There was a knock at the door. Come in, she said absently. Havelman entered. He had the large body of an athlete gone slightly soft, thick gray hair, and a lined face. First glance, he didn't look 60. His well-tailored blue suit badly needed pressing. <clears throat> Doctor? Evan stared at him for a moment. She would kill him. She looked down at the desk, rubbed her forehead with her hand. Sit down, she said. She took the pack of cigarettes from the desk drawer. Would you care to smoke? The old man took one. She watched him carefully. Her brown eyes were rimmed, his brown eyes were rimmed with red. They looked apologetic. I smoke too much, he said. I can't quit. She gave him a light. More people around here are quitting every day. Half one exhaled smoothly. What can I do for you? First, I want to play a little game. Evans took a handkerchief out of a pocket. She moved a brass paperweight, a small model of the Lincoln Memorial, on the center of the desk blotter. I want you to watch what I'm doing now. Havelman smiled. Don't tell me you're going to make it disappear, right? She tried to ignore him. She covered the paperweight with a handkerchief. What's under this handkerchief? Can we put a little bet on it? Not this time. A paperweight? That's wonderful. Evans leaned back with finality. Now I want you to answer a few questions. The old man looked around the office curiously at the closed blinds, at the computer terminal and keyboard against the wall, the pad of switches in the corner of the desk. His eyes came to rest on the mirror opposite the window. That's a two-way mirror, Evans sighed. No kidding. Are you recording this? Does it matter to you? I'd like to know. Common courtesy. Yes, we're being videotaped. Now answer the questions. Havelman seemed to shrink in the face of her hostility. Sure. How do you like it here? It's okay. A little boring. Man couldn't even catch a disease here from the looks of it, if you know what I mean. I don't mean any offense, doctor. Haven't been in here long enough to get the feel of the place. Evans rocked slowly back and forth. How do you know I'm a doctor? Aren't you a doctor? I thought you were. This is a hospital, isn't it? So I figured when they sent me in to see you, you must be a doctor. I am a doctor. My name is Evans. Pleased to meet you, Dr. Evans. She would kill him. How long have you been here? The man tugged on his earlobe. I must have just got here today. I don't think it was too long ago. A couple of hours. I've been talking to the nurses at their station. What she wouldn't give for three fingers of Jack Daniels. She looked at him over the steeple of her fingers. Such talkative nurses. I'm sure they're doing their jobs. I'm sure. Tell me what you think you were doing before you came to this hospital. You mean right before? Yes, I was working. Where do you work? I've got my own company, ITG Computer Systems. We design programs for a lot of people. We're close to getting a big contract with Ma Bell. We swim that and I can retire by the time I'm 40. Uncle Sam will take his hand out of my pocket long enough for me to count my change. Evans made a note on her pad. Do you have a family? Havman looked at her steadily. His gaze was that of an earnest young college student in Congress on a man of his age. He stared at her as if he could not imagine why she would ask him these abrupt questions. She detested his weakness, raised in her a fury that, 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 that pushed her to the edge of insanity. It was already a bad day and it would get worse. I don't understand what you're after, Havman said with considerable dignity. But just so your record shows the facts, I've got a wife, Helen, and two kids. Ronnie's nine and Susan's five. We have a nice big house and a Lincoln and a Porsche. I follow the Braves and I don't eat quiche. What else do you want to know? Lots of things. Eventually I'll find them out. Evan's voice was cold. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? How you came to be here? How long you're going to have to stay? Who you are? His voice went similarly cold. I know who I am. Who are you then? 
My name is Robert Havelman. That's right, Dr. Evans said. What year is it? Havelman watched her warily, as if he were about to be tricked. What are you talking about? It's 1984. What time of year? Spring. How old are you? 35. What do I have under this handkerchief? Havelman looked at the handkerchief on the desk, as if noticing it for the first time. His shoulders tightened, and he looked suspiciously at Evans. How should I know? He was back again that afternoon, just as rumpled, just as innocent. How could a person get old and still be innocent? She could not remember things ever being that easy. Sit down, she said. Thanks. What can I do for you, doctor? I want to follow up on the argument we had this morning. Havelman smiled. Argument? This morning? Don't you remember talking to me this morning? I never saw you before. Evans watched him coolly. The old man shifted in his chair. How do you know I'm a doctor? Aren't you a doctor? They told me I should go see Dr. Evans in room 101. I see. If you weren't here this morning, where were you? Havelman hesitated. Let's see. I was at work. I remember telling Helen, the wife, I try to get home early. She's always ragging me because I stay late. Company's pretty busy right now. Big contracts in the works. Susan's in the school play. We have to be there at eight. I want to get home soon enough before that than to do some yard work. Looks like a good day for it. Evans made a note. What season is it? Havelman fidgeted like a child, looking at the window, where the blinds were still closed. Spring, he said. Sunny, warm, very nice weather. The red buds are just starting to come out. Without a word, Evans got out of her chair and went to the window. She opened the blinds, revealing a barren field swept with drifts of snow. Dead grass whipped in the strong wind, and the sky roiled with clouds. What about this? Havelman stared. His back straightened, and he leaned forward. He tugged at his earlobe. Ha! Ah! Isn't that a bitch? If you don't like the weather here, wait ten minutes. What about the red buds? The weather will probably kill them. I hope Helen made the kids wear their jackets. Evans looked out the window. Nothing had changed. She slowly drew the blinds and sat down again. What year is it? Havelman adjusted, adjusted himself in his chair, calm again. What do you mean? It's 1984. Did you ever read that book? Slow down a minute. What are you talking about? Evans wondered what he would do if she got up and ground her thumbs into his eyes. The book by George Orwell titled 1984. She forced herself to speak slowly. Are you familiar with it? Sure. We had to read it in college. Was there a trace of irritation behind Havelman's innocence? Evans sat in silence as, as still as she could. I remember it made quite an impression on me, Havelman continued. What kind of impression? I expected something different from the professor. He was a confessed liberal. I expected some, some kind of bleeding heart book. It wasn't like that at all. Did it make you uncomfortable? No. It didn't tell me anything I didn't know already. It just showed what was wrong with collectivism. You know, communism represses the individual, destroys initiative, claims it has the interests of the majority at heart, it denies all human values. That's what I got out of 1984. But to hear the professor talk about it, it was all about Nixon and Vietnam. Evans kept still. Havelman went on. I've seen the same mentality at work in business. Large corporations are just like the government. Big, slow. You'd show them a way to save a billion and they'd squash you like a bug because it's too much trouble to change. You sound like you've got some resentments, said Evans. The old man smiled. I do, don't I? I admit it. I've thought a lot about it. I have faith in people. Someday I may just run for a state assembly and see whether I can do some good. Her pencil point snapped. She looked at Havelman, who looked back at her. After a moment, she focused her attention on the notebook. The broken point had left a black scar across her precise handwriting. That's a good idea, she said quietly, her eyes still lowered. You still don't remember arguing with me this morning. I never saw you before. I walked in this door. What were we supposed to be fighting about? He was insane. Evans almost laughed aloud at the thought. Of course he was insane. Why else would he be there? The question she forced herself to consider rationally was the nature of his insanity. She picked up the paperweight and handed it across to him. We were arguing about this paperweight, she said. 
I showed it to you and you said you'd never seen it before. Havman examined the paperweight. <clears throat> Looks ordinary to me. I could easily forget something like this. Was that a big, what's the big deal? You note it's a model of the Lincoln Memorial. You probably got it at some gift shop. DC is full of junk like that. I haven't been to Washington in a long time. I live there, Alexandria anyway. I drive in every morning. Evans closed her notebook. I have a possible diagnosis of your condition, she said suddenly. What condition? This time the laughter was harder to repress. Tears almost came to her eyes with the effort. She caught her breath and continued. You exhibit the symptoms of Korsakoff's syndrome. Have you ever heard of that before? Haldeman looked as blank as a whitewashed wall. No. Korsakoff's syndrome is an unusual form of memory loss. Recorded cases go back to the late 1800s. There was a famous one in the 1970s, famous to doctors, I mean. A Marine sergeant named Arthur Briggs. He was in his 50s, in good health, aside from the lingering effects of alcoholism, and had been a career non-com until his discharge in the mid-60s, after 20 years in the service. He'd functioned normally until the early 70s. He lost his memory of any event which occurred to him after September 1944. He could remember in vivid detail, if they just happened, events up until that time, but the rest of his life, nothing. Not only that, his continuing memory was affected so that he could remember a he could remember events that occurred in the present only, only for a period of minutes, after which he would forget totally. I can remember what happened to me right up until I walked into this room. That's what Sergeant Briggs told his doctors. To prove it, he told them that World War II was going strong. He was stationed in San Francisco in preparation for being sent to the Philippines. But it looked like the St. Louis Browns might finally win a pennant, if they could hold on through September, and that he was 20 years old. He had the outlook and abilities of an intelligent 20-year-old. He couldn't remember anything that happened to him longer than 40 minutes. The world had gone on. He was permanently stuck in 1944. That's horrible. So it seemed to the doctor, in charge at first. Later, he speculated that it might not be so bad. The man still had a current emotional life. He could still enjoy the present. It just didn't stick with him. He could remember his youth. For him, his youth had never ended. He never aged. He never saw his friends grow old and die. He never remembered that he himself had grown up to be a lonely alcoholic. His girlfriend was still waiting for him back in Columbia, Missouri. He was 20 years old forever. He had made a clean escape. Evans opened a desk drawer and took out a hand mirror. How old are you? She asked. Haldeman looked frightened. Look, why are we doing... How old are you? Evans' voice was quiet but determined. Inside her, a pang of joy threatened to break her heart. I'm 35. What the hell... Shoving the mirror at him was as satisfying as firing a gun. Halfman took it, glanced at her, then tentatively, like the most nervous of college freshmen checking the grade on his final exam, looked at his reflection. Jesus Christ, he said. He started to tremble. What happened? What did you do to me? He got out of the chair, his expression contorted. What did you do to me? I'm 35. What happened? Dr. Evans stood in front of the mirror in her office. She was wearing her uniform was quite as ruffled as Haviland's suit. She had the tunic unbuttoned and was feeling her left breast. She lay down on the floor and continued the examination. The lump was undeniable. No pain yet. She sat up, reached for the pack of cigarettes on the desktop, fished out the last one and lit it. She crumpled the pack and threw it at the wastebasket. Two points. She'd been quite a basketball player in college, 20 years before. She lay back down and took a long drag on the cigarette, inhaling deeply, exhaling the smoke with force, a sigh of exhaustion. She probably could not make it up and down the court a single time anymore. She turned her head to look out the window. The blinds were open, revealing the same barren landscape that showed before. There was a knock at the door. Come in, she said. Half of them entered. He saw her lying on the floor, raised an eyebrow, grinned. You're Dr. Evans? I am. Can I sit here or should I lie down too? Do whatever you fucking well please. He sat in the chair. He had not taken offense. So what do you want to see me about? Evans got up, buttoned her tunic, sat in the swivel chair. She stared at him. Her face was blank, pale, her thin lips steady. It was the expression of a woman terminally ill, so accustomed to her illness and the necessity of ignoring it, that all that showed of the pain was mild annoyance. I'm going to see this through, her face said, and I'm going to kill myself. 
Have we ever met before? she asked. No, I'm sure I'd remember. He was sure he would remember. She would fucking kill him. He would remember that. She ground out the last inch of cigarette. She felt her jaw muscle tighten. She looked down at the ash ashtray in regret. Now I have to quit. I should quit. I smoke too much myself. I want you to listen to me closely now, she said. Do not respond until I'm finished. My name is Major D.S. Evans. I'm a, I'm a military psychologist. This office is in the infirmary of NECDEC, National Emergency Center for Defense Communications, located 1,000 feet below a hillside in West Virginia. As far as we know, we're the only surviving government body in the continental United States. The scene you see through this window is being relayed from a surface monitor in central Nebraska. By computer command, I can connect us with any of the 12 monitors still functioning on the surface. Evans turned to her keyboard and typed in a command. The scene through the window snapped to a shot of broken masonry, twisted steel reinforcement rods. The view was obscured by dust, caked on the camera lens by a heavy snowfall. Evans typed in an additional command, touched one of the switches on her desk. A blast of static, hissed like frying bacon, came from a speaker. That's Dallas. The sound is a reading of the background radiation registered by detectors at the side of the camera. She typed in another command, the image on the window flashed through a succession of equally desolate scenes, holding 10 seconds on each before switching to the next. A desert in twilight, motionless under low clouds, a murky underwater shot in which the remains of a building were just visible, a denuded forest half buried in snow, a deserted highway overpass. With each change of scene, the loudspeaker stopped for a split second, then the hiss resumed. Have been watched all this soberly. This has been the state of the surface for a year now, ever since the last bombs fell. To our knowledge, there are no human beings alive in North America, the Northern Hemisphere for that matter. Radio transmissions from South America, New Zealand, and Australia have one by one ceased in the last eight months. We have not observed a living creature above the level of an insect through any of our monitors since the beginning of the year. It is the summer of 2010, although considering the situation, Counting years by the old system seems a little futile to me. Dr. Evans slid open a desk drawer and took out an automatic. She placed it in the middle of the desk blotter and leaned back, her right hand touching the edge of the desk near the gun. You are now going to tell me that you never heard any of this, that you've never seen me before in your life. Despite the fact that I've been speaking to you daily for two weeks, you've had this explanation from me at least three times during that period. You're going to tell me that it is 1984, you are 35 years old, despite the absurdity of such a claim. You're going to feign amazement and confusion. The more I insist that you face these facts, the more you're going to become distressed. Eventually, you will break down into tears and expect me to sympathize. You can go to hell. Evan's voice had grown angrier as she spoke. She had to stop. It was almost more than she could do. When she resumed, she was under control again. If you persist, if you persist in this sham, I may kill you. I assure you that no one will care if I do. You may speak now. Halvelman stared at the window. His mouth opened and closed stupidly. How old he looked, how feeble. Ever felt a sudden wave of pity and doubt. What if she were wrong? She had an image of herself as she might appear to him, arrogant, bitter, incomprehensible inquisitor, whose motives for tormenting him were a total mystery. She watched him. After a few minutes, his mouth closed. His eyes blinked rapidly and were clear. Please, tell me what you're talking about. Evan shuddered. The gun is loaded. Keep talking. What do you want me to say? I never heard any of this. Only this morning I saw my wife and kids and everything was all right. Now you give me the story about atomic war in 2010. What have I been asleep for 30 years? You didn't act very surprised to be here when you walked in. If you're so disoriented, how do you explain how you got here? The man sat heavily in the chair. I don't remember I guess I thought I came here, to the hospital, I thought, to get a checkup. I didn't think about it. You must know how I got here. I do, but I think you know, too. You're just playing a game with me, with all of us. The others are worried. I'm sick of it. I can see through you, so you may as well quit the act. You're famous for your sincerity. I always suspected that was an act, too. I'm not falling for it. You didn't start this game soon enough for me to be persuaded you're crazy, despite what the others may think. Evans played with the, belt of her dead, with the butt of her dead cigarette. Or 
This could be a delusional system. So continue. You think you're in a hospital and your schizophrenia has progressed to the point where you deny all facts that don't go along with your attempts to evade responsibility. I suppose in some sense, such an insanity would absolve you. If that's the case, I should be more objective. Well, I can't. I'm failing my profession, I realize. Too bad. Emotion had gradually drained away from her until by the end, she felt as if she were speaking from across a continent instead of a desk. I still don't know what you're talking about. Where are my wife and kids? They're dead. Halfman sat rigidly. The only sound was the hiss of the radiation detector. Let me have a cigarette. There are no cigarettes left. I just smoked my last one. Evan's voice was distant. I made two cartons last a year. Halberman's gaze dropped. How old my hands are. Helen has lovely hands. Why are you going on with this charade? The old man's face reddened. God damn you. Tell me what happened. The famous Halberman rage. Am I supposed to be frightened now? The hiss from the loudspeaker seemed to increase. Halberman lunged for the gun. Evan snatched it and pushed it back from the desk. The old man grabbed the paperweight and raised it to strike. She pointed the gun at him. Your wife didn't make the plane in time. She was at the Western White House. I don't know where your damn kids were. Probably vaporized with their own families. You, however, had Operation Kneecap to save you, Mr. President. Now sit down and tell me why you've been playing games, or I'll kill you right here and now. Sit down. A light seemed to dawn on Haverman. You're insane, he said quietly. Put the paperweight back on the desk. He did. He sat. You can't simply be crazy, Haverman continued. There's no reason why you should take me away from my home and subject me to this. This is some kind of plot. The government. The CIA. And you're 35 years old. Haverman examined his hands again. You've done something to me. And the camps? Administrative Order 31. If I'm the president, why are you quizzing me here? Why can't I remember a thing about it? Stop it. Stop it right now, Evan said. She heard her voice for the first time. She said, more like that of an old man than Havelman's. I can't take any more lies. I swear I'll kill you. First it was the commander-in-chief routine, calisthenics, stiff upper lips, discipline. Then the big brother, let's have a whiskey and talk it over, son. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Havelman stared at her. He was going to make her kill him, and she knew she wouldn't be strong enough not to. Now you can't remember anything, she said. Your boys are confused. They're fed up. I'm fed up too. If this is true, you've got to help me. I don't give a rat's ass about helping you, Evan shouted. I'm interested in making you tell the truth. Don't you realize that we're dead? I don't care about your feeble sense of what's right and wrong. Just tell me what's keeping you going. Who do you think you're going to impress? Think you got an election to win? A place in history to protect? Isn't going to be any more history. History ended last August. So spare me the fantasy about the hospital, the non-existent nurse's station. Someone with Korsakoff's wouldn't make up that story. He would recognize the difference between a window and a projection screen. A dozen other slips. You're not a good enough actor. Her hand trembled. The gun was heavy. Her voice trembled too. She despised herself for it. Sometimes I think the only thing that's kept me alive is knowing I had half a pack of cigarettes left. That and the desire to make you crawl. The old man sat looking at the gun in her hand. I was the president. No, said Evans. I made it all up. His eyes seemed to sink farther back in the network of lines surrounding them. I started a war. Evans felt her heart race. Stop lying. You sent the strike force. You ordered the preemptive launch. I'm old. How old am I? You know damn well how... She stopped. She could hardly catch her breath. She felt a sharp pain in her breast. You're 61. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. That's it? That's all you can say? The old man stared hollowly, then slowly, so slowly that at first it was not apparent what he was doing. He lowered his head into his hands and began to cry. His sobs were almost inaudible over the hissing of the radiation detector. Dr. Evans watched him intently. He rested her elbows on the desk, steadying the gun with both hands. Haverman's head shook in front of her. Despite his age, his gray hair was thick. After a moment, Evans reached over and switched on the lap switched off the loudspeaker. The hissing stopped. Eventually, Haverman stopped crying. He raised his head. He looked dazed. His expression became unreadable. He looked at the doctor and the gun. My name is Robert Haverman, he said. Why are you pointing that gun at me? 
Please don't, said, said, said Evans. Don't what? Who are you? Evans watched his face blur. Through her tears, he looked like a much younger man. It got drooped. She tried to lift it. It's as if she were made of smoke. There's no substance to her. It's all she could do to keep from dissipating, let alone kill anyone as clean and innocent as Robert Havelman. He took the gun from her hand. Are you all right? he asked. Dr. Evans sat in her office, hoping it wasn't going to be a bad day. The pain in her breast had not come that day. She was out of cigarettes. She searched the desk on the odd chance that she might have missed a pack, giving a single butt in the corner of one of the drawers. No luck. She gave up and turned to face the window. The blinds were open, revealing the snow-covered field. She watched the clouds roll beside the, before the wind. It was dark. Winter. Nothing was alive. It's cold outside, she whispered. There was a knock at the door. Dear God, leave me alone, she thought. Please leave me alone. Come in, she said. The door opened and an old man in a rumpled suit entered. Dr. Evans, I'm Robert Havelman. What did you want to talk about? 